forgetting. Um, so we are doing amazing. I like unbelievable. What I'm talking about is the spread the spread of COVID. Um, guys, as a school, we are setting the standard in terms of limiting the spread of this bug. Um, you know that Pleasant Grove, um, in literally a matter of 90 minutes, went from, hey, yo, to see you later. Um, yeah, so you guys know, you know Monday, um, they, they had a spike in cases. It did not push them over the 15 case limit, at which point school just shuts down. Um, but it was enough that the, the health, the county health, decided that they needed to go into a modified schedule. Um, but guys, the bottom line is it happened fast. Like Monday, midday, and boom, and no school Tuesday, no school Wednesday. And then frankly, Thursday, do you guys know about what they're doing? Yeah, so two days in, two days out, but alternating. So Thursday, today, and tomorrow, Friday, the only kids in the building are A through K. Then coming back after Labor Day weekend, it's L through Z, A day, B day, rinse and repeat. Just a second. So the original thought was this. Imagine this. So today, Thursday, A day, the only people that would be in this room are A through K. What about L through Z? Well, the original thought was L through Z watches the screencast and stays up with what's going on in the class. And then after Labor Day, L through Z are in the building. A through K are keeping up at home. Then, I don't know at what level this decision was made, but the decision was made that that's not the model. That you can only... It's the wrong word, but it works. You can only expect students to do work based upon what they encounter in school. So functionally, what that means is right now, if you're a PG kid, L through K, you're doing nothing. So functionally, what that means is we have slowed down the year by 50%. So guys... I don't know what that means in terms of precedent. I don't know if that's the model. What I do know is that this is going to get weird. Well, let me say that. I pray this doesn't get weird. But if it does get weird, it's going to get weird quick. Um, and there's the possibility that they send something out tonight that says, hey, yo, or I'm high, no school tomorrow. So, guys, fundamentally what this means is we're just going to have to be super flexible. Um, we don't know what tomorrow holds. All we can do is go, it sounds like a sermon, um, but, but we can just work with today. And it's funny, Matt and I, we talked about this the very beginning of the year because it's really unsettling. Um, but guys, all the more reason we need to get a group me pulled together. And I would like to do that um, today. In a, and we're all here, so this will work out great. Um, the other thing, though, that I'd like to say is um, in an AP class, it's different, right? In a Gen Chem class, they call off school, hey, yo, right? Have a great day. But guys, in, a gen in an AP class, every day we lose is a day that we're further away from being ready for the test. Um, and so, guys, you know me well enough to know that I do not bow at the feet of this test. Um, I believe that it's valuable, but I believe that it's very low on the list of, of things that make this class worth your time. So, guys, what we're going to do is we are going to, um, should something weird happen, we're going to handle this very reflexively. If we know that it's just a couple days out, we're not going to push. But if we're like, hey, see you at Christmas, right, then we're going to have to make some adjustments and we'll simply do that by communicating out. Um, frankly, at that point, I'm probably going to be asking you as many questions as I am giving you directions. And we're going to rally together and figure this out. So Chandler, you had a thought. 
No, no. So, well, next week because it's Labor Day, right? But, but no. The bottom line is, is they're on they're on an A day B day rotation just like us. So, yeah. So it's still the A day B day rotation. It's just on the on the first. So today and tomorrow, A day B day. Half the kids are in the school. The next A day and B day, the other half of the kids come into school to do what the previous group did the days before. Correct. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. By 50%. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so guys, all of this to say we're doing great. Um, if I may then use this as the opportunity, this is not me preaching, but. Um, guys, I would propose to you that the most important thing that we can do this year is do the things that are within our control to try to keep this place open. And within these doors, within these walls, we're killing it. Sorry, my mask keeps doing this, but guys, we're doing really well, but I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I have a daughter that's a sophomore at Timpanogos. Um, she goes to group gatherings outside of school. Um, she's at volleyball practice and no one has masks on. Um, and so guys, there are calculated risks, right? Volleyball to her is worth the exposure with the understanding that if things get weird, it could impact the entire school. Um, but I'll be honest with you, it is so hard for her and us as a family to try to manage the rest of this. Um, she's always getting invitations to gatherings, and I'm not in any way saying we do this right. This is not, this is not gospel truth. Um, but we, we've come to the point where we realize it's impossible to not be with friends, but let's be with smaller groups of friends. Um, things like that. Let's, let's be outdoors rather than indoors. But again, guys, there are people right now that would say that our family is a bunch of idiots and it should just be game on. There's other people that would say that we're taking unnecessary risks and that she should not be going out at night. So guys, I'm not in any way trying to push an agenda. What I'm simply saying is be purposeful about the decisions that you make. Uh, because understand, guys, it's not just exposure in school. I have kids right now that are quarantined and their exposures were outside of school. So, gang, we, we need to be wise about this. Um, I know that there's um, people that are planning big homecoming dances over the weekend. Um, I, I would at least encourage you to be thoughtful about the choice you make. Um, because I'll tell you right now, I, I need this place to stay open. I know that this sounds really weird, but guys, right now, you guys are breathing life into me. Um, I, I need to be around you. Um, you're like a drug, man. Um, but no, seriously, I need to be around people. I'm a people person. And when you lock me up in my office and make me teach that way, I, it works and I'm good at it, but I hate it. I need to be here. So, Yeah. Let's make good choices. Anyway, so guys, can we talk about homework? Yeah, please. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hot in the middle of this right now. I had an exposure in my classroom. Um, not in here, obviously, because you're all here. But it's actually really funny because now when I walk into class, this particular class, it looks like a bomb went off because there's this big hole in the middle of the room and no one's there. And you're like, oh, does anybody want to guess who the, yeah, so. Uh, but it is, and that's exactly the answer. So here's the deal. Um, 15 simultaneous cases. So 15 people, uh, 15 students or teachers that test positive, school's done. Simul no, yeah, good question. So the, the word that they're using is active cases. So if we have 15 active cases, which I have to believe is defined by in that two-week period of transmittability, um, 15 cases were done. But understand, the original thought was the whole district is done. 
And then they came back and said, no, we can be smart about this. Let's close selectively. Um, so it's 15 active cases. Um, but PG doesn't have 15. I forget. I think it's like six or seven. And so they got immediately closed for sanitation. They brought in all the janitor and they just steam cleaned the whole school. Um, then they're opening back up on a modified, you know, that schedule with the hopes that they never get to 15. So, but that caught me off guard. I thought it was either open or closed. This modified thing is new to us and they're still making it up as they go. But 15 is the trigger. The thing that I'm learning though is that this is wildly up to interpretation, that it's being managed by the county health and then the local school nurses. And I, you know, I had a school nurse in my room. Then we were almost about to break out a tape measure and go, were they six feet apart? And then the other magic thing is 15 minutes that if you were not in proximity of somebody that was either symptomatic or positive, if you were not in their proximity for more than 15 minutes, you don't quarantine. Um, so it has to be proximity 15 minutes. So this is crazy. You'll like this. I actually had a parent of one of my daughter's volleyball teammates who we're family friends with. And so the 15 minute rule, right? She said, so why doesn't every teacher in the school just have all of their students reshuffle every 14 minutes and then we'll never need to quarantine? It, in theory, would work. Um, and, but all of that to say, Ethan, this is, we're making this up as we go. There are guidelines and there are rules, but I mean, I stood in my room for half an hour trying to figure out how to apply these rules to my students. And it, even that was complicated. So we're doing our best. Do that again. Yeah. Right. Well, that's exactly what they did. So check this out. So you know how I redo my seating charts? So we actually had to go back and dig our seating charts from day one because the exposure came the second day of school. The, the kid was at school for the first two days of school, got sick, stayed home a couple days, got tested. So his quarantine started the first day that he got stayed home. So that was the beginning of his quarantine because he was symptomatic. The problem is, is that the kids that were then exposed, their quarantine doesn't start until after they've been identified. So it's like the kid that was the original infector is already back in school, but none of the kids that he exposed are. So it's, I don't know. It's really interesting to me. So, Donnie, were you going to say something? That's a good question. Yeah, so if we do hit 15, and again, they're making this up as they go. My understanding is 15 means two weeks and then regroup. Um, I would be really, really surprised if we end up with March 13th. You know what I'm saying? Close everything down indefinitely. I really don't think, and I could be really naive, but I really don't think we're going to do that. I hope not to. Go ahead, Mary. Emma, for example. Yes. So you may know something that I don't, but my understanding is that, no, 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 no. But what I'm saying is to my knowledge, they are not making policy decision based upon um, immunity from having contracted it. Um, I haven't seen, and I've looked, but I'm not, you may again know something I don't. I haven't seen any solid scientific evidence that, that assures us that once you've contracted it, you do have immunity. Um, okay. Yeah, no, 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 I understand. Right, and so, and if that's the case, that's awesome, but I haven't seen any policy based upon that 
hope. Um, I don't know. I would love for that to be the case, um, but I, I really don't know. I'm not sure. What is that? Oh, say that again. Or were you not talking to me? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So if Bra so this is interesting. If Braden has it, Leslie gets to stay and Ethan goes home. See, but I, I don't know. Oh, I, oh, so you're not talking proximity. You're talking exposure. I don't know. I, the only thing I know for sure is that if braden has got it, people behind him don't need to leave and people next to him in front do. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> What's that, Josh? What? So you would be gone too. Yeah. 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 Sure, which means as a percentage, their six is a smaller percentage than ours and they still shut them down. But they're a build, bigger building. So density. Hey guys, anything else we need to talk about relative to this? My under, good, so my understanding is three, that we have currently three, again, the word active cases. Um, I, I also read that there's, I think the number was 48. There's like 48 active cases district-wide, which is unbelievable because we're a district of tens of thousands of students. So it's pretty cool. No, thank goodness. They did away with that, that it's, it's individual schools. Hey, so guys, I know this is kind of a stretch, but should we do some chemistry? Hey, why not? Hey, so, I know, that's right. Although it's interesting, sorry, I got to take us off track for another second. So, and guys, again, you understand that this coronavirus thing, as much as it is an epidemiological issue and consequently a scientific issue, it is also a very heated political issue. Um, and this is not me talking politics at all, but Donnie or Daniel or somebody said I love coming to COVID class. <laughs> um, guys, it was interesting. I met a couple days ago with the, with the district science leadership. And one of the things that they are talking about is the idea that we as science teachers have a responsibility to help our students read and interpret data independent of the craziness on CNN and Fox News. Because um, right now we are demonstrating that we are a people, a population, a nation that largely is incapable of understanding information and instead we listen to loud voices. We also guys are a country that is inherently untrusting of science. Um, I would propose to you that this started during the global warming and climate change thing where the two political parties stacked up around this and said, hey, this is really an issue. Let's deal with it just a second. But thank you for waiting. And on the other side of this, people are saying this is stupid and made up. Because if you notice that the same people are making the same arguments about the pandemic that they are about global warming. <laughs> Have you ever read Flat Earth websites? I abs I'm about halfway convinced they're right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, come on. Hey, but no, guys, in, in all seriousness, I would propose that you guys as scientists might be able to play a role in this. Um, and guys, w regardless of which side you fall on this politically, I would propose to you, and, and I, maybe I'm preaching a little bit, but understand I'm not preaching either side of this. What I am suggesting, guys, is that we as a nation are demonstrating a fundamental misunderstanding of how science works. You guys understand this. Science is messy. Science is uncertain. 
you go into lab and you collect data and some of you even now walk back in here and went, crap, my data's all wrong, I gotta go back. Or you got in here and you went, wait, my data didn't really show me what I thought it was going to show. But isn't that the scientific process? That you propose a question you go into lab and you collect the data and then you come back and you report on that data. And guys, that's the beauty of science. Your proposal doesn't have to be right. There's as much value in finding out that you were wrong as there is in finding out that you're right. Now guys, understand that normally as a nation that scientific process happens in the background that there are always scientists doing research, but they don't get the microphone until they're done and they get to say, here's what we've learned. The mistake that we're making is that Fauci and the CDC and all of these people come out and they say, here's what we think. And then they collect the data and find out that they're wrong. And as a scientist, they're completely comfortable with that. They're like, oh, this is science. It's not wrong to be wrong because we're learning. But in the public eye, it makes it look like they're changing their minds and they're indecisive. And many people would say that they're lying. A great example is masks. Originally, the CDC came out and said, you don't need to wear masks. They're ineffective. Partially the reason they said that is because we were running out of masks and people were hoarding them and we needed them for the healthcare workers. And so the CDC came out and said, don't worry about masks, they're ineffective. Then they start doing research and they find out that no, in fact, with the novel coronavirus, these things actually seem to be cutting down on transmission. We're finding that even at the state level now. So now all of a sudden we've got Fauci and the rest of these people coming back and going, you know what guys, we're learning that masks actually might help so much so that we're going to put in mandates that say we need to wear them. And then all of a sudden people that don't know how to do science are going, you're a liar, you hate Trump, you this, you that. It's not about politics, it's about science. So guys, if we could stand in the gap and if we could simply help people understand that science is messy, and because it's messy, people are going to be changing what they're saying based upon them learning more, that could radically change this conversation. With that said, I think the CDC is totally screwed up. They need to understand their, not they're screwed up, they're screwing up. Guys, the CDC needs to understand their audience and their audience is science illiterate. So stop doing science in front of people and just start giving people the sound bites that they're looking for because we are not capable of digesting this as a country. So anyway, I just recorded all of that. <laughs> there you go. So guys, be the voice of reason in this otherwise ridiculous world. You know that there are people right now that actually believe that one, the coronavirus doesn't exist. Two, this is actually real, look this up. There are people that believe that only 9,000 people in the world have died of the coronavirus. 9,000. All the rest of this is made up. 9,000 have died and that's it. But there's also people that believe that the New World Order released the coronavirus into the wild to reduce the population of the world by a billion people so that it would be easier to dominate the smaller population. And guys, if you don't believe that there's people that believe this and they vote, guys, seriously, do this for me. Get, no, 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 get online, not now, get online and look up what happened at the Provo City Commissioners meeting. One of the Provo City Commissioners piled that meeting room full of anti-maskers. And then when the meeting started, and this is, it's okay. If you want to be an anti-masker, you have the freedom to do that. That's fine. But they piled the room full of anti-maskers and then things blew up. They had to cancel the meeting. And as all of these very angry people were coming out of the meeting, they interviewed one of them. And she was willing to give her name and her quote was about the New World Order trying to kill people. Look it up, guys. I'll look it up in a minute. I'm not making this stuff up. And they vote. Yeah. 
What? Yeah. Go ahead, Spencer. Oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? Of course, yeah. Yes. Yes. I saw that too. I love it. It's really good stuff. Hey guys, allow me to pull us together. So, <laughs> sorry. To me, that wasn't time wasted. Um, it was probably some of the best things we could have done with the last 20 or 30 minutes. But guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to gather us around this homework for a minute and I'd like to answer a big question that many of you have already come and asked individually, but I'd like, excuse me, to address it corporately. And the question is simply this, how are we supposed to know? How are we supposed to know if this is a weak acid or a strong acid or a weak base or a strong base? How are we supposed to know? And guys, I'll mention Matthew because he and I had this conversation most recently. So when Matthew and I talked, but I had this conversation with at least two or three other groups in here. Uh, Matthew came in on his own. Um, guys, the answer to the question, how are we supposed to know, frankly, is ultimately based on experience. Over time, you will get enough experience with these things that it will begin to come, become second nature. But guys, the problem is, is you're like, okay, what about in the meantime? Then what, right? Allow me, if you would, to offer some suggestions. So guys, the conversation that we're having is a big conversation about weak, strong acids, bases, electrolytes, the whole shtick. So if you want to scratch this down somewhere, you may not even need to. No, you know what? Never mind. It's in the screencast. If you need this, you can find it. After the 20 minutes about coronavirus. So guys, first of all, acids. Weak and strong acids. First thing that you're looking for is hydrogens. But now your weight. Alcohols have hydrogens. Bases have hydrogens. What's the deal? Well, guys, what we're looking for is this. Hydrogens bonded to ions or hydrogens, let me do that differently, or hydrogens that are caught up in this thing. So when we're looking for acids, it will either be hydrogens bonded to ions or hydrogens that are at the tail end of this COOH critter. These are your acids. But guys, more specifically, these are your strong acids for the most part, and these are your weak acids. So what then are the ions that count? Chlorine, bromine, iodine, ClO3, ClO4, NO3, and HSO4. One, two, three, four, five, six, that's it. So guys, those are the seven strong acids. So if you have got a hydrogen bonded to one of those dudes, strong acid. If you have a hydrogen that is bonded to a COOH, or if you have a hydrogen that is bonded to an ion that's not one of those, it'll then be a weak acid. No, and that's the trick. Let's, 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 while we're doing this, I was going to go to weak bases, but let's do that right now. So what about the non-electrolytes relative to hydrogen? The non-electrolytes, let me do this differently. The non no, actually what I did there was okay. The non-electrolytes are OHs bonded to molecules. And when we say molecules, we typically mean carbon. So you've got some big old CH3, CH2, OH. That's going to be an alcohol. 
So what's the difference? And the difference is this oxygen right here. This oxygen weakens this bond and makes it an acid. In an alcohol, we don't have an additional oxygen, and as a result, it doesn't break there. So that makes that an alcohol. Okay, so now let's talk about bases. So when we talk about bases, the conversation is a little bit different. Guys, the thing that you want to look for is OHs. But you're like, wait a minute, we just talked about OHs and we said that they're alcohols. The difference is these are bonded to a metal. That's not really the abbreviation for metal, but okay. Me. Bonded to me. So guys, these are the bases. So when you have a metal that is bonded to a base, or I'm sorry, when you have, when you have a metal that's bonded to an OH, and remember guys, specifically, we talk about group one and heavy group twos. Those are your bases, strong bases. So anytime you have a metal bonded to an OH, this is either going to be a strong base or, or, Guys, or it's going to be non-soluble. An example of that, and we'll talk more about this today, an example of that is something like aluminum hydroxide. Guys, aluminum hydroxide is not a strong base. Why not? Please. Yeah, it's not a group one or a heavy group two. So guys, what does aluminum hydroxide do in water? The answer is nothing. It doesn't dissolve. So guys, the only soluble hydroxides are the group ones and the heavy group twos. Those are the hydroxide salts that dissolve. They ionize when they dissolve and that makes them strong bases. All the rest of the hydroxide salts do not dissolve in water. Therefore, they're not strong electrolytes. Therefore, they're not strong bases. Is that okay? Then guys, finally this. What about the weak bases? And guys, the answer right now is this. Look for nitrogen. For now, the only thing that you need to know about weak bases is they contain nitrogen. NH3, ammonia, of course, is our most simple example. But guys, you saw in homework, there are other examples. So guys, let's talk. What is it that makes nitrogen a base? And the answer is based in, sorry, based in what bases do. Um, so guys, the answer to why is nitrogen a base is, is built on what do bases do? Well, they take in hydrogens. But remember, hydrogen ions are protons. This is just a big old ball of positive which is wildly attracted to those two unbonded electrons on the nitrogen. And this is what makes nitrogen such, such an effective base. Not a strong base, but still a very effective base. So guys, that's your 10-minute ten, your ten summary. Matthew, I know that was, that was more than I spoke with any of you about. Um, but um, just from having conversed with you, I know the questions are out there. So I'm glad we got to address them. So guys, let's use that then as a foundation upon which we can talk about these. But guys, what I'd like to do now is this. Let's not grade this homework today. Sorry, we never grade it. Let's not review this homework today. Let's do this. We only, there were only like three questions left in the homework we didn't do, right? So guys, why don't we spend the next 25, 30 minutes, wrap up the rest of this conversation, then go back and re-examine these questions given the conversation that we just had, and then let's address lingering questions on Tuesday. Good? Okay. So guys, grab your class notes if you would, please, and we're going to dig in. You started these last time. We'll just jump in. Because those are the only ones that dissolve in water.
That's a brilliant question, Spencer. We're actually going to talk about that later, but that is a brilliant question. Okay, so go ahead. Correct. Hydrogen ion, but yes. Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. Hey, so guys, let's talk for a minute. Um, Braden brings up a really insightful question. Um, we've established, I'm thinking, let me repeat your question, I'm paraphrasing. But Braden said, when we think about bases, we understand that bases take in hydrogens, protons, hydrogen ions. So as you said, that makes sense when we talk about weak bases, right? So for example, if we've got NH3, uh, we've got water, we know that the, the NH3 takes in a hydrogen, it forms NH4, and it kicks out hydroxide, right? So fundamentally, we can see how NH3 functions as a base because by our definition, it's taking in a hydrogen from the water, classic base behavior, right? But now if I understand your question, you're like, well, wait a second. If we look at something like NaOH, NaOH breaks into Na and OH, right? So we understand that NaOH is a base, but what about this idea that bases take in hydrogens? Where is that, right? Is that your question? Okay, it's a great question. So guys, to answer the question, what I'd like to do is offer you two ideas. First of all, another way to think about bases, because it is absolutely true that bases take in hydrogens. I'll show you in a minute. But when they do, they increase the concentration of hydroxide. So given that other way of thinking about bases, that they actually make OH, we can see that the strong bases do that. Now let's answer your question. So where, and guys, don't miss this. This is good chemistry. Here's the idea. So where in this is the taking in of hydrogen? And guys, the answer comes with a question. Here's the question. Where does this take place? in water. Yes? Sodium hydroxide is a pellet or a flake. It is a salt. You put it into water, it dissolves and it ionizes and it makes this. So guys, in order to understand the answer to Braden's question, which is where does the taking in of hydrogen come from, you've got to understand that this happens in the presence of water. Now guys, this is the part you're not going to like, but this is the idea. This OH right here is understood, ready for this, to react with the water. Here's what it does. When OH, you're not going to like this, when OH reacts with water, this is our base. So what is this going to do? Take a hydrogen, you see where this is headed, it's going to take a hydrogen from water, and what does it make? water and hydroxide that's the answer so but understand this is this isn't just this is really happening so we actually have a reaction where the reactants and the products are the same thing but if we could track individual protons in a sodium hydroxide solution you would see that those protons are actually transferring between hydroxides yeah so there's the answer yeah no. Um, well, so <laughs> it's a great question. Um, no, because that concentration of hydroxide is represented by the full concentration of the OH that comes from the base. So, the, so reaching all the way back to here, for every, so if we have one molar NaOH, we have one molar hydroxide. So it's not less than that, which would be the case if it was reaching equilibrium. It, it's a weird question though, because it's a reaction that never really goes to completion because the reactants in the products are the same thing. 
um, which isn't true in the classic understanding of equilibrium. Um, so it's, it's a weird other thought. We just need to understand that they do completely break apart. Is that okay? Yeah. Good question. And the answer is it doesn't. And we're going to talk, sorry, we're going to talk about this in February. It turns out that sodium is a acid of negligible strength. That does not have the ability to act as an acid towards water. And we're going to talk all about this later in the year. But sodium does not react with the water. The OH does. How are we doing, gang? We okay? It is, oh my gosh. Yeah. So guys, what I'd like to do then is this. And I, this, is, this is a little bit of free form, but it's going to fit in. I'd like to take this equation right here, and I would like to use it to begin another conversation. This is not on the notes, but you guys asked to talk about this, and I'd like to do that. So, come on. So guys, do this with me just briefly so that we can talk. So guys, one of the things that you realize was a part of this acid-based conversation from last year was the idea of conjugates. You guys, I'd like to refresh your memory on this. Understand, understand that when, when you get that Jurassic or season 7 and 7 team, and this is what is once for God's forgotten about and about and about and about. Guys, when I get chapter 16 and 7 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 and so NH3, acid or base? Base. Contains nitrogen, right? It's a weak base, but it's a base. So guys, if NH3 is the base, what does that make water? The acid. This becomes our source of hydrogen. Then guys, from there, it's time to talk conjugates. And gang, when we do conjugates, the easiest way to do it is this. Go to the acid, take away a hydrogen. What is left is the conjugate base. Then the other thing is the conjugate acid. So guys, I don't want to do a super deep dive on this, but I would like to at least chat about this. What does it mean to be a conjugate acid and a conjugate base? Are they really acids and bases? And the answer is absolutely. But look at this. If this is the conjugate acid, what is it going to do? What do acids do? Give away hydrogens. So guys, this is an acid, and it's going to give away a hydrogen. Where does that hydrogen go? To the base, not to the water, to the OH. So when this gives away a hydrogen, it's going to go to the conjugate base, the OH. So when this gives away a hydrogen, the hydrogen does this. So when this loses a hydrogen, what does it turn into? NH3. And when this gains a hydrogen, what does it turn into? Water. And this is how this thing reaches equilibrium. The conjugate acid gives a proton to the conjugate base. Then they turn back into the original acid and base, and it goes round and round and round and round and round and reaches equilibrium. But guys, understand these conjugate acids and bases are acids and bases, and that's what drives these to equilibrium. Is that okay? Okay, now do this one with me. Write it down with me. Um, let's just do something familiar. HCl in water. So guys, can, I know it's not there yet, maybe, but is it okay to say that HCl is a strong acid? Okay. So this is our acid. This is our base. By the way, guys, let's pause for a minute and talk. What do we call things like water that can be both an acid and a base? 
Do you remember? Amphoteric. You would have never... I, this is why, guys, online school is less awesome. Um, so, guys, this is what is called amphoteric. Sorry, I'm hiccuping. It might be a word you want to at least scratch into your notes. Amphoteric means a substance that can be both an acid or a base. Water is not the only one. We'll talk more later. But then, guys, the acid gives away a hydrogen. It forms chloride ion. Then the hydrogen goes to water, and it forms hydronium ion. Exactly. There's our hydronium ion. Remember, guys, whether we represent it or not, whenever a hyd whenever a water wow, whenever an acid gives away a hydrogen, it goes to water and forms hydronium. Yeah. Yeah. So if the water became hydronium ion, this would make this an acid. Okay, so now you're ready for a deep thought. So we talked about this idea that NH3 is a base, that HCl is an acid, and so on. But underlying your question is a brilliant thought. You ready for this? So guys, Chandler's question is functionally this. Why doesn't the hydrogen go that way? Why doesn't the hydrogen move towards the NH3? And I'm sorry, my bad. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Other, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about why is it the hydrogen doesn't go this way? Why does water not pick up the hydrogen and that forms NH2 minus? Guys, you ready for a deep thought? When we say that something is a base, simply what that means is more basic than water. And when we say that something is an acid, it simply means more acidic than water. Guys, acids and bases literally pivot on water. So up until now, we've just blindly said, oh, this is an acid. But technically what that means is more acidic than water. And when we say something is basic, it simply means more basic than water. And we'll quantify that in chapter 16. Exactly. And actually, um, here, let's do this. Yeah, so guys, um, Braden had a really brilliant thought. He's like, is that why water is right in the middle? What did I miss? Ah, so guys, do this with me, just really quick. If you, um, you know what? Never mind. The one that I was looking for isn't in this book. Um, so let's just say, yes, Matthew, you were right. <laughs> Go ahead. Ooh. That's brilliant. Check this out. Um, so does that, let me follow, let me say that. So does, does that mean that NH4 is more acidic than water? What would make you believe that that's true? Absolutely. But it's even deeper than that. NH4 is a better acid than water. And the way that we know that, and I'm sorry I keep saying this, we'll do the math later. In a solution of NH3, it's about 95% NH3, and it's about 5% NH4+. Plus. So the NH4 plus is so much better at giving away hydrogens, better acid, than this is good at taking in hydrogens, that 95% of it lives over here because this is really good at pushing the direction, the reaction in the other direction. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 
One more thought, you guys. You ready? Let's go down here and do conjugates. Go to the acid, take away the hydrogen. What's left is the conjugate base. That then makes this the conjugate acid. So Spencer, this is going to be right to what you said about sodium, only for chloride instead of sodium. But check this out. You guys good with the acids, the bases, and the conjugates? Here's the question. Is this reaction properly written, or should it go both ways? Does it go both ways? Do this. Is hydrochloric acid a strong acid? What does that mean? Completely breaks apart. So if it completely breaks apart, does it go backwards? No. Why? And the answer is this. This is a worthless conjugate base. We will not use the word worthless. The actual term is of negligible strength. We're going with worthless. But guys, functionally, what it means is this. And check it out, and you'll understand why. But guys, chloride has no ability to grab that hydrogen back from the hydronium ion. This is a worthless conjugate base. As a result, this does not go backwards. Therefore, it completely breaks apart. So you guys are ready to have a really deep thought? Guys, all of these are worthless conjugate bases. Make that connection. Because they're the ions of strong acids, we know that they can't go backwards. These are the, are, are all seven of these are worthless conjugate bases, making their molecules with hydrogen strong acids. Do you get the idea? Okay, so guys, with that as a review, we've got one more thing that we need to do and we're ready to go. Go ahead, Annika. Yes, um, so let's do this. And Spencer, this is exactly your question. So Annika is saying, are the conjugate acids of the strong bases also worthless? Let's talk about which ones those are. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, calcium, strontium, barium. Those dudes are worthless conjugate acids, which makes their hydroxide salts strong bases. Spencer, that's also why sodium doesn't react with water. Sodium ion doesn't react with water. Yeah. So con the word conjugate means to form. As a verb, it means to form. And so when we talk about a conjugate when we talk about a conjugate acid, it is the acid that is formed from the base. Because realize that the base turns into the conjugate acid, and then the acid turns into the conjugate base. So conjugate means to form. Like if you've taken Spanish or French, you conjugate verbs, you're forming new verbs. But, but by that's, Daniel, that's an interesting question. What, when we go back, doesn't that make these conjugates? And it's at this point we define our terms. The stuff on the left will always be our acid and base. The stuff on the right will always be our conjugates, just for clarity's sake. Go ahead. Yes, every time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you understand we could have written these in the opposite order, but the acid always becomes the conjugate base. The base always becomes the conjugate acid. Yeah. You guys good? Okay. So, guys, we've got one more thing to do, which breaks itself into three parts. And it goes like this. So, guys, what we need to do now, and you've got to get this in your notes. Guys, when we talk about acid-base reactions, there are three types of acid-base reactions that you need to have a handle on. The first of these is called a neutralization reaction. Braden alluded earlier to the idea that water's in the middle. 
Acids on one side, base on the other, water's in the middle. But guys, what's the pH of water? Ah, seven. Neutral. So guys, fundamentally, the idea is this. When you react an acid with a metal hydroxide base, this reacts to form salt and water. And guys, at this point, it's important for you to remember that salt is not just NaCl. It is any positive and negative ion bonded together. So refreshing your memory on that, in a salt, the cation, the metal, comes from the base. The refresher is that salts contain cations. The new bit is that the cation comes from the base. Then, guys, the anion comes from the acid. So guys, this is interesting and an opportunity for you to practice on something that you uh, are developing the ability to do. So for example, hydrobromic acid, one of the seven strong acids, potassium hydroxide, uh, one of the group of strong bases. Here's what I'd like you to do. Predict the products and write the net ionic equation. You're going to find this interesting. So guys, what I'm functionally asking you to do is write the complete molecular equation and then the net ionic equation. I'll give you about a minute to do it, then we'll do it together. And then, Michaeli, before we leave today, um, I'd like to get your email address. And I'm going to build a group me group, and I'd, I'd like to put you in it. So, um, I mean, obviously, we'll all be in it, but you'll be leaving. And we're going to catch the rest of them during third period. Um, so don't forget to, yeah. Actually, if you just want to do this, do you want to just write it down for me? Um, not your school address. Yeah. Yeah, because GroupMe doesn't play well with the Alpine SD accounts. Guys, understand, we'll talk in a minute, but joining this GroupMe group is optional. Um, if you don't feel comfortable having your personal contact information out there. I could have guessed that. <laughs> Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, guys, you ready? Here we go. This reaction is actually a double displacement reaction. I'm going to rewrite it so it's a little bigger. So we have HBr reacting with KOH. So what's going to happen is the positive ion hydrogen is going to hook up with the negative ion OH, making water. There you go. <laughs> and then, guys, our other product, of course, will be the KBR. And, guys, forgive me, I'm running out of room, but notice what we've got here. We now have a salt, that's horrible, but you know what it says. Guys, we now have the salt potassium bromide. Notice that the cation, potassium, came from the base. Notice that the anion bromide came from the acid. So our salt is potassium bromide. Now, guys, let's write the net ionic equation. So here we go. Let's look at bromide first. Bromide is a halogen. What do we know about the halogens? They always dissolve in water, right? So guys, remember, unless they're bonded to silver, lead, or mercury. So guys, that's a spectator. 
Now, what do we know about potassium as a group one metal? Also always dissolves in water. So this guy's gone. So gang, the ions that make up our salt are spectators. But the hydrogen starts dissolved in water and it ends up in water. The hydroxide starts dissolved in water and ends up tied up in water. So guys, hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion did chemistry forming water. That is our net ionic equation. And that is the net ionic equation for all neutralization reactions. It's just the formation of water. Water is neutral. That's where the name comes from. Get the idea? Okay. So guys, again, there are three types of reactions you need to know. That's number one. Here comes number two. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Right. So bromine's dissolved in water here. Oops. It's dissolved in water there. Potassium is dissolved in water here. It's dissolved in water there. So it's not changing. But they don't. And that's the problem is, is if we wrote the net, the complete ionic equation, potassium bromide is soluble in water. Exactly. Right. Yep. Please. You mean like if we were to evaporate the water, then yes, you would get potassium bromide salt. That's what would be left over. Exactly. That's correct. Yep. You got it. Okay, guys, reaction type number two. You ready for a deep thought? Goes like this. I would write this down. You ready? Just because a substance isn't a strong base doesn't mean that it's not a good base. Guys, some of the most powerful bases that we have are not strong bases. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Aluminum hydroxide. Guys, write this down. This is going somewhere. Aluminum hydroxide. Is aluminum hydroxide a strong base? It is not. It doesn't dissolve in water. It is non-soluble. So this is not a strong base. But guys, this is an amazingly good base. You add acid to this and it will neutralize it like crazy. It is a really good base. It's just not a strong base. By the way, this is the active ingredient in Tums and Rolaids because it's so good at neutralizing acid in our stomach. So guys, what does that reaction look like? Well, here is the hydrochloric acid in our tummy. So what are the products? Well, the aluminum hooks up with the chloride and it makes AlCl3 and then the hydrogen hooks up with the hydroxide and it makes water. So guys, we've got three OHs, we've got one OH, so we need a three, three hydrogens, and now that's balanced. But guys, in order to write the net ionic equation, this is going to be important. This is a solid. This is aqueous. This is aqueous. Water is a liquid. So now, guys, let's find our spectators. Aluminum starts out as a solid. Where does aluminum end up? Dissolved in water. It did chemistry. Hydroxide starts as a solid. Where does it end up? In a liquid. That did chemistry. Hydrogen 
starts as an ion in water and it ends up in a liquid. That did chemistry. Chloride starts as an ion in water. Where does it end up? An ion in water. This is our only spectator. So the net ionic equation then is aluminum hydroxide plus three protons yields aluminum ion and three waters. The only spectator in this reaction is chloride. No, because this is a solid, it starts as a salt. Yep. Okay, guys, we've got two more to go. These both fit under the larger heading. Oh, sorry. These both fit under the larger heading of gas forming reactions. Now, guys, because of the conversation that we had about COVID, we may run a couple minutes late. So, Michaela, obviously, you can excuse yourself if you missed the last, you may miss the last three minutes of this. Catch the screencast. Guys, for the rest of you, I'm going to ask you to stay through the break, and then we'll take our own break after we're done. It'll be like four minutes. Okay. So, guys, these are what are called the gas forming acid base reactions. There's two types. The first are the reactions of the sulfides. So guys, let me show you an example of a sulfide. This is sodium sulfide. It doesn't smell like sulfur. Actually, it does a little. But guys, this is sodium sulfide. Here's the trick. What happens when we dump an acid onto this? Well, let's find out. So sodium sulfide, again, this stuff. And let's just react that with hydrochloric acid because that's familiar. Guys, predict the products. I can do this with you. Na hooks up with Cl. NaCl, the H hooks up with the S, but guys, sulfur is minus two, so that makes H2S. Now let's balance it. Two sodiums, one sodium, so we need a two. One sulfur, one sulfur, two hydrogens, two chlorines, we're good. Michaela, if you want to excuse yourself, um, and like three minutes in the screencast and you'll be good to go. So guys, now let's do this. Let's write the net ionic equation. So I know you probably don't know this, but this dissolves in water, this dissolves in water, this dissolves in water. But guys, do any of you know about hydrogen sulfide gas? Have you ever been to Yellowstone? Yeah. Guys, this is it. See you, Kaylee. Guys, this is the rotten egg smelling gas that will knock you out, literally, actually, not to kill you. Guys, that'll knock you out at Yellowstone. This is our gas. As we're saying that, guys, when we get back from Labor Day weekend, we are going to do some reactions like this. This one we will do in the fume hood because the hydrogen sulfide gas is actually not good for us. We're going to make it, but we'll do it in the fume hood. So guys, with this information, please cross out the spectators in this reaction. Do it now. So let me catch up with you and maybe you can help me think through it. So sodium starts aqueous, sodium ends up aqueous. Does sodium do chemistry? 
Does sodium ever do chemistry? No, it's always soluble. Sulfur starts out aqueous and ends up in a gas. Did it do chemistry? Yeah. Hydrogen starts out dissolved in water, ends up in a gas. Chemistry? Yeah. Chloride starts dissolved in water, ends up? No chemistry. So guys, what we've got then is sulfur plus two hydrogens yielding H2S. Here's the thing. That's completely wrong. What's missing? Charges. Sulfur is minus two. Hydrogen is plus one. Don't forget. You're going, why do charges matter? Because, guys, charges indicate that these things are dissolved in water. These are ions stabilized in water. So you have a sulfide ion reacting with two protons to form hydrogen sulfide gas. That's the net ionic equation. You guys good? One more to go. So guys, the last reaction type that you need to know are the reactions of the carbonates and the bicarbonates. So it doesn't matter which one we choose, a carbonate, which is CO3, 2 minus, or a bicarbonate, HCO3, um, in their salt forms, we could look at something like sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, codename baking soda. Guys, it doesn't matter which one we choose. The chemistry is the same. The only difference is how they balance. So let's just do sodium carbonate. So sodium carbonate, and let's just use hydrochloric acid because it's familiar. So guys, let's go through and do this together. I think the chemistry is gonna be complicated enough. I shouldn't turn you loose on this. So the sodium hooks up with the chlorine, no surprise making sodium chloride. Then guys, the H hooks up with the CO3. Carbonate is minus two, so it makes H2CO3. This is what is called carbonic acid. But now guys, here's the tricky bit and the part that we need to talk about. Carbonic acid is very, very unstable. Um, it doesn't like to stay together. And so what happens after the carbonic acid is formed is the carbonic acid actually breaks apart immediately into carbon dioxide and water. So guys, this is actually gone. As fast as it gets produced, it breaks apart. So your products are actually NaCl, carbon dioxide, and water. So now guys, let's do the net ionic equation. This is aqueous, this is aqueous, this is aqueous, this is a gas, and this is a liquid. So let's get rid of our spectators. So sodium starts out aqueous, ends up aqueous, sodium's gone. That should start to feel familiar to you. Carbonate starts aqueous and ends up in carbon dioxide. So it did chemistry. Hydrogen starts out aqueous and ends up in water. So it did chemistry. Chloride starts aqueous and ends up aqueous. So guys, our net ionic equation looks like this. CO3 2 minus plus, oh, this isn't balanced. There should be a two there, sorry, right? Oh, and there should be a two here. Um, sorry, I forgot to balance it. Plus two protons yields carbon dioxide and water, and that's where the gas comes from. So guys, there you have it. Um, we are now done with our conversations about acids and bases. Um, that leaves us with 
the remainder of this homework to do. Uh, let's take a five to seven minute break and we'll gather back up when you're done. Hey guys, please do not interrupt other classes while you're out there.